So welcome to this Transatlantic Talks podcast. Today we will be focusing on transatlantic security. Um, this is a series of Transatlantic Talks, which is co-hosted by the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy, the Young Transatlantic Initiative in Vienna, and the entire Transatlantic Talks series is supported by the U.S. Embassy in Vienna. My name is Michael Sinkonel. I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy, and I have the great pleasure to be joined today by Michael Kaufman, top, top expert on the security and military dimension of the Russian war on Ukraine. Michael, you are a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and also a frequent contributing editor to The War on the Rocks, and host of the Russian Russia Contingency podcast at War of the Rocks. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks so much for enabling this podcast and this recording, which we are actually recording from the European Forum Altbach. And today, as I mentioned, we would like to talk about the challenges and opportunities of transatlantic security against, of course, the background of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Also, because 2024 marks a very important year for NATO, it's its 75th anniversary, so we also believe that this is certainly also a good time to talk about the challenges, the opportunities, but also the future perspective of transatlantic security. So my first question, Michael, to you would be, how has the transatlantic security cooperation changed since February 2022? How has the Russian invasion of Ukraine transformed the transatlantic security ever since? Good question. I mean, I think you could pick a lot of things to point to, but to me, perhaps the most interesting ones are first that uh, countries within NATO now have some sort of force requirements to a regional defensive plans, which I think is very significant because for a very long time, you know, NATO was very much based around out-of-area operations, and the only requirements countries genuinely had was to be able to supply troops to, to missions like in Afghanistan. And so that's become more significant. Now there's some cogent requirements, regional defense plans. There's been a lot of work done in the last two years. I'm going to focus on NATO first, because I think when we talk about transatlantic security, that's sort of the elephant in the room, and you might as well start with it. Um... You know, obviously it also was expanded to uh, 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 Finland and Sweden, which I think are great additions as far as countries go, both capability and defense industrial capacity. It will be interesting to see how their voices uh, change things in the lines, but it will also down the line add significant frontage to NATO as well, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, the primary in-area threat uh, on this continent. Uh, as far as... The conversation goes on resourcing. I think that this war has, to me at least, demonstrated some interesting findings. The first, and this is going to be a quintessentially American point of view, it illustrated that uh, the United States has an important and enduring role to play in European security. If, if anything, for the very simple reason that European militaries are in many respects codependent on the United States for the conduct of any large-scale operations on this continent. They have evolved over many decades, right, to characterize transatlantic security practice, such that they are complementary, they are like boards that plug into the motherboard, but that motherboard in terms of organizational capacity, logistics, and enablers is very much the U.S. military. And, and the Russia-Ukraine war showed that very much. Um, United States, uh, in, in, in collaboration with European allies, took over much of the logistics and training effort, right? Although many other uh, European countries took, took on pieces of that challenge. But the United States, I think, has, has probably done the most in terms of the actual, like, nitty-gritty logistics mm -hmm. of SAGU and what have you. Um, as far as contributions go, right, Europeans have contributed quite a bit, but the key things that Ukraine depended on, artillery ammunition, precision-guided munitions, these sort of things, uh, a lot of that was the United States. And here, you know, I have some of the positive and negative comments as to what we saw in the war. The first is that I think many, many European countries simply did not take this seriously as a prolonged conventional war, 
and did not make the necessary investments in defense industrial mobilization in the first year. You know, I think the United States certainly could have done better in a number of areas as well. Uh, I think that the war highlighted that we were woefully short in terms of defense industrial capacity and stocks. And now there's going to be a challenge. Will these countries continue spending money to support Ukraine's military? Are they going to potentially pull back in order to spend on rearmament? Or will we see, I know this is a fantasy, but will we see an increase in European defense spending to actually meet the security requirements that they now have? To meet Ukraine's requirements to some extent for sustainable military and to rearm European militaries, which have expended both munitions and equipment, okay? Uh, and political leaders will have to take that on. Like they need to, they need to be convinced that Russia remains an enduring in-area threat as a revisionist power. Russian reconstitution is not an if but a when, and we can debate when Russia can sufficiently conduct large-scale combat operations such that it poses a serious threat to, let's say, a NATO member. You might say, it depends on who it is and where. Military power is context dependent. So if you're Estonia, you might say in three years. Mm -hmm. And if you're Poland, you might say five. And if you're Germany and France, you might say seven. And to some extent, you're all right with those answers. But I'll tell you the truth of it. As someone who works on defense issues and has worked on them for quite a few years, 10 years is a really short amount of time. 10 years is kind of the minimum defense planning timeline that you typically do things. Uh, you just typically plan ahead, um, and you have to do things in terms of force structure, force posture, capability development, what have you. So it's always a challenge to convince political leaders of the importance of making investments now, because from a defense analyst point of view, 10 years is going to be around the corner. Actually, the older you get, the faster time goes by. So you, it might, it might be tomorrow for, for some of us. Uh, whereas for political leaders, 10 years sounds like uh, very far away and they will not be in their, in their office at that mm -hmm. time. So it, sound, it sounds like it could be other people's problems, right, from a political point of view. And that's also part of the challenge is to get, uh, to get Europe past the rhetoric and to the actual investments, right? And in that regard, I've seen big changes in what European countries were willing to do for Ukraine. If you just look at the Germans, a year and a half ago, they weren't willing to give tanks without the United States holding their hand, Okay. A year and a half after that, German martyrs are operating in Russian territory in Kursk, and German political leadership seems to have just shrugged the whole matter away. Whereas barely two years ago, this was a major psychological step, right? So in some cases, you definitely see transition and change. But in other areas, you definitely still see continuity with a lot of rhetoric and not nearly as much in terms of investments, multi-year contracts, and, and decisions to either expand, uh, expand the capacity of the force, the main European militaries are, at the end of the day, well capable. They tend to be brittle and tend to be fairly low on either readiness or capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for this very in-depth analytical thoughts. Um, probably with a, a follow-up question to that, um, based on also the statements that you have just mentioned, how can the U.S. and the European Union together support Ukraine more effectively in defending itself against the Russian aggression? What are possible prospects and perspectives that you see for especially the long-term future, or say mid to long-term future, in intensifying the security cooperation across the Atlantic? So, I mean, in the past year, you've seen uh, U.S. efforts with Europeans to give NATO a stronger role in uh, in support of Ukraine's war effort. We'll see what that leads to. I mean, there's always pluses and minuses to that. I always see pluses. I'm wary that it might be a bit of a bureaucratic attempt to sort of Trump-proof security assistance to Ukraine. Um, there are also minuses, which is with NATO, there are more committees, and, 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 and Ukraine is already worried about, uh, about leaks regarding its operations and state of its forces, given uh, the partners it already has to deal with. Um, you know, once you add NATO into the mix, that challenge only multiplies. Mm. But uh, but that's sort of the negative. Let's talk about the positive. So on a positive, I see uh, fairly close cooperation between the United States, UK, other European countries and Ukraine. Look, let's be very honest. That we are where we are at this point in this war. And I won't say the war is on a particularly positive trajectory. It's not. And the Kursk offensive so far hasn't changed that. The last 10 months have been negative. You know, Russia doesn't have a particularly strong hand, but materially it's advantage this year. Let's see what happens next year. 
this isn't a podcast on the war, but we have to establish facts first and foremost, which mm-hmm. is, don't know what's going to happen in the next six to 12 months, but, um, but, but you, overall, the war has not been on a good trajectory in, in the past year. Certainly, certainly not since Ukraine's offensive failed last summer. And the West pro- policy in this war has been adrift. Right? Folks look a lot increasingly out of ideas, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, you know, I'm a bit concerned about all the risks that have been taken on in the Kursk offensive on the one hand. On the other hand, Ukrainians are right to point back and say, what were your ideas? Like, just you know, steadily retreat across the front in Donetsk, and how would that motivate people? And if we're going to lose this part of the front anyway, then... Why is rolling the dice on this kind of offensive not not a why is that why is that uh, a chance not worth taking? But you know, as far as cooperation goes, I think that the arc of this war has been uh, early on. You know, Ukrainian will to fight was was necessary, but it would not have been sufficient. Ukraine would have lost this war in twenty twenty two if it wasn't for the United States and for European countries. This war would have had the arc of the Winter War. For those of you who are familiar with the Soviet Finnish War, um, and 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 that to me is just the historical reality. I think a lot of folks still don't appreciate the extent to which direct intelligence support and other involvement of U.S. and U.K. really shaped outcomes, battlefield outcomes uh, uh, in this conflict. Last point I say is there have been s- still pretty important constraints, and I think the biggest decision the United States made in this war that I that I don't agree with, and I think it's it's probably the the inevitable evolution of uh, security cooperation assistance to Ukraine from the United States and from other European countries, which is we have sort of tried to be as materially involved in this war as possible from equipment, ammunition, intelligence support, targeting, the whole, basically the whole thing as much as you can, but without being directly involved in the war ourselves. And, um, and that's had real limitations because we don't have people on the ground. There's a lot we don't understand about the Ukrainian military. There's a lot we don't understand about the battlefield. There's much we don't understand about what will work, what will not work. How do you do joint planning if you're not there and you don't see the actual fight? As an analyst who's traveled to this war and to the front lines over the course of the last two and a half years, I'll tell you, you just can't do it from 10,000 miles away. Okay? You just, it's hard. It is very hard because you are sort of imagining what the fight looks like. And this is a conventional war. Um, and while our military has had experience in conventional wars, let's be honest, our last 30 years of experiences are against the Iraqs and Afghanistans and Syrias and Libyas of the world. And, you know, that, um, while those were challenges in their own right, uh, uh, it's not comparable to what I've seen. No, it's not even remotely comparable to what I've seen in this conflict. So I think it is inevitable that we are going to have to have an expanded Western presence in terms of trainers. And maintainers and advisors. The U.S. has been very reticent because after Afghanistan and some other wars, the U.S. has been, we don't want to own this war. This is Ukraine's war first and foremost, right? We're not going to show up and do the typical American thing, which is start taking over everything, then telling everyone they don't know what they're doing, right? And then saying, let us run the whole thing. And then when we have to leave, everything collapses like a house of cards, right? Or alternatively, these things don't work without us because we were running them the whole time anyway. I think that there's a huge range of involvement between that extreme, let's say Afghanistan, and the, you know, no people on the ground of any kind, right? No contractors, no maintainers, none of this. I think if we don't do it, then Europeans will. Macron tried to push that earlier this year in, I think, a bit of a kludgy manner, the way it sort of came out, didn't look especially coordinated with other European allies, but he tried to move the needle in this conversation, um, perhaps a bit fitfully. Uh, and my sense of it is that ultimately we are going to have, if not American, then certainly Western European trainers there. Look, it's, it's just not sustainable to prosecute the war this way. If there's a ceasefire, there's a pause, an intermission in the war, if it's not enduring, it will also create the opportunity. If Ukraine has inherited a, a veritable zoo of Western equipment, there's a nightmare to maintain. We have to localize maintenance, right? We have to rationalize the force and help them with it. We have to help them with their training programs. They have significant issues in training, absorption, and mobilized personnel. I could keep making a long list, and I don't think we have time on this podcast. But the story I'm trying to tell is that the critical decisions that were made or not made were far less about specific capabilities. You know, do we give attackums or not? Do we give storm shadow or not? Are we going to provide the, the leopard tank, mm-hmm. you know, or, or or some other tank? That's not that's not it's not been so much that. And and to all the folks that are 
Excited about F-16s. F-16s are a great capability and a platform that will require a long-term transition. None of these individual capabilities by themselves are going to be are necessarily going to prove that decisive. However, a robust investment in Ukraine as a bulwark of European security, a long-term vision beyond the next six or, or 12 months regarding security assistance to Ukraine, and an effort to transform the force and turn it into something that, that, uh, that with our effort can be sustained. And then in the future, let's say however this war ends, a force that's capable of defending Ukraine against a future Russian attack. Because look, it's very likely that if, even if there is a ceasefire, there probably won't be a political settlement. And what happens to wars when you already had a second war, a continuation war between two states, and that war does not end to the satisfaction of either state and resolves none of the political issues? What normally happens historically? More often than not, there's a good chance there'll be a third war. Okay? And I think we have to be realistic about that. And the question is looking at European defense spending and a lack of security commitment to Ukraine beyond the bilateral security agreements, which are not commitments. And the United States, ours has no funding behind it from Congress. It's not, it's not the relationship even that we have with Israel. Okay, so the most logical investments in the Ukrainian military, right? It's also in terms of uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis and return on investment, probably the best one you can make. And Europeans, while perhaps short on defense industrial capacity, are not lacking for funding, and, and neither are we. Although I'm not sure we're going to get another supplemental from Congress like what we got this year. And that's also another reason why we have to think about purchasing power parity and localization of, of uh of defense industrial production maintenance. And there's a, bit lo there's a much longer story, but basically trying to discuss about what the future evolution has to be of security assistance to Ukraine, how we get from, here's like a whole bunch of tanks for brigades and our infantry fighting vehicles and what have you, to investing much more in Ukrainian defense industrial production, localized maintenance, repair, rationalize that force, investing much more in their training, scaling up their training, trying to see how much of this can be shifted in Ukraine with our assistance. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yes, it will involve taking some risk of having some folks on the ground. But we have to also be wary of the slippery slope fallacy argument that any greater involvement inherently leads to us taking over this war. Right? I think, I think we have to take on some risk. In the Middle East, the United States has been willing to have forces on the ground in Iraq and Syria who have been struck and attacked before in the past by Iran. Because the typical argument that if we have any of our troops or forces on the ground, Russians will strike them and then um, we'll have to go to war with Russia because somebody hit whatever the whatever the base was, whatever the facility was. And I'm thinking, one, that's not necessarily true. Uh, the Russia would do that, but let's say they would. Second is, that's happened plenty to us in the Middle East and we've not gone to war with Iran. So why why, why is the why is there much more risk tolerance there? And of course, anyone listening to this could say, yes, but Russia's a major nuclear power, and there the risk of escalation, the consequence much worse. I get that, but a reading of Cold War history suggests that we're in a position where we could take on a bit more risk than none, right? Without being reckless about it, I'm, I'm not known for having particularly hawkish views, and I'm not advancing this as a theory of how to slowly entrap the U.S. and NATO into eventually joining the war or into building some kind of no-fly zone. I just think that we've reached the outer limits of what we can achieve, and if the outer limits of what we can achieve in this war is still a negative trajectory for Ukraine and no clear path to war termination on favorable terms, which is an assessment you could come to potentially in the next several months, then what was it for? Right? Like, yeah. we have to be able to do at least a bit better than this, I think. It's a very good and very compelling argument indeed. Um, linked to that, last question, where do you see the most crucial shortcomings? I mean, I know that you have touched on those already now, but probably more in a sense of if you'd have two to three recommendations for European, for American stakeholders, on tackling these shortcomings. What will be your two or three most important takeaways for European, for US American political stakeholders? By shortcomings, do you mean shortcomings specific to this war or shortcomings regarding transatlantic security? I do believe they're linked in some way, but I would now focus on transatlantic security cooperation. Well, here's the issue. The war is the war. It's a specific context, right? And and our contingencies vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, Russia would look different. They have a different geography, different actors. Yeah. And that's very important for folks to understand. Um, a lot of people deal with this kind of, I think, erroneously believe in the abstract notion that military power just sort of exists and nebulously and can be measured. But it's heavily context-dependent. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's actually one of the many reasons why some of our assumptions about the the initial invasion were wrong. There are a whole host of reasons for it. But but the contingencies most of us focused on were, were Russia and NATO contingencies, which looked very different. 
it was a very different type of invasion yeah. as the initial operation and what have you. So, but to get to your question, um, you know, the first is we have to we have to make sure we're asking the right questions. What are the actual lessons learned from this war, and which ones are portable to the NATO Russia context, right? To the rest of transatlantic security and the contingencies that we use to develop our defense planning, right? Not to read too much into the war and say everything from this war maps onto a NATO Russia fight. No, it doesn't. Not everything. Um, on the other hand, quite a few things do, and we should learn from this war. We might have run into a lot of the same issues that the Ukrainian military and the Russian military ran into. And so having robust lessons learned effort, or at least, you know, observations and counter, uh, and, and a good conversation about what does this mean for for how our forces have to change and evolve. You know, how do you deal with mass precision in a close-in fight? How do you deal with proliferation of UAS and, and systems of that nature? Um, I, I've spoken quite a bit about this over the years yeah. following this war. Uh, looking at re rethinking the big fundamental questions, right? Talk about force structure, like reinvesting in your force design and asking, do you have the forces to meet these needs? A lot of European militaries, for example, have kept telling themselves that they can continue advancing uh, boutique capabilities and leaving the whole question of sort of mass, greater capacity and ability to withstand high levels of attrition more to the United States. But the U.S. is also consistently messaged to European allies that uh, while we're obviously not in any way leaving Europe, you cannot, you cannot bank on a substantially increased American military presence in this content because the United States sees its principal competitor and challenger and rival as China, and U.S. strategy sees the Indo-Pacific as the primary theater and Europe as the secondary theater for the first time in a very, very long time, and as a secular trend in U.S. strategy, no matter who wins what election. It's important to convey that, right? Because I think, I think it's not always clear to European colleagues that it's not. It's the, the the difference will not be made in one president. I mean, yes, elections matter. That's why we have them. And I understand that if Trump and JD Vance win, Europeans probably will be concerned about potential changes to to his role. I won't get into that because one, I'm not knowledgeable, and I don't know how much of that's true. But that's not the point. The point is to understand the much bigger secular trends in U.S. strategy and the conversation being had in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that means that, you know, European allies then have to think how much more of the of the security tab can they pick up? How relevant do they want to be to the U.S. contest with China in the Pacific? And, and, and in which way, right? Some, some folks think, like, Europe needs to find a way to militarily contribute. I'm not in that camp. I'm actually in the camp of, like, please, please help handle more of your own area. You can deal, help deal with China in all sorts of other ways, right? Like China's, you know, from, from tech economic issues, cyber issues, a whole host of them, right, that, that don't involve uh, uh, having, having to get into the questions of military power projection. Um, you know, what, what should the balance of effort be? Should we try to push uh, Europe and should Europe itself seek to develop capabilities such that it can operate independently in the United States, mm -hmm. which will take it quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I'll be very frank. This is aspirational. Whenever Europeans talk about strategic autonomy, I'm always looking and saying, hey, this is great. It's fantastic that you aspire to this, but you need to appreciate how far away from it you are right now and not delude yourself either in this conversation. Uh, if so, then who should be the leading states in, in Europe that would be providing uh, the key enablers, the organizational capacity uh, to do this? Then, you know, it's, and it's always a challenge from a US perspective too. I think, I think we're, we're, we're schizophrenic on ourselves sometimes, just mm -hmm. looking at my own policy communities. On the one hand, we always look to Europe to do more and want Europeans to, to be able to do more. On the other hand, usually whenever there's a situation and Europe is starting to do more, uh, U.S. policy folks quickly show up and say, oh, hold on, you guys don't know what you're doing. Let us lead you. We start to infantilize our colleagues a little bit and tell them, no, no, let, let, let us do this for you. We'll take the lead. And then afterwards we complain that European colleagues don't develop the autonomous capacity to do the things that we, that we in, perhaps in occasionally in an overbearing manner, don't, uh, don't encourage them to do in the first place. So I'm aware of it, and, and having worked on this for some years, I, I, also see the, I also see the duality of the U.S. approach, where U.S. can't always decide um, what, what it wants more. But, yeah, but the point I want to make is that I think Europeans have to think through of uh, what should the nature of their investments be? Because right now, a lot of what European militaries look like, it's militaries who are closest to Russia, right? And... Um, they, they may invest the most in, in their armed forces, 
But their armed forces are going to be focused primarily on national defense contingencies and have the least capacity to deploy. Meaning, let's say hypothetically, let's say if you're Finland, in any contingency with Russia, your job wants to defend the massive Finnish border, right? And let's say if you're the Baltic states in any contingency with Russia, your job wants to defend the Baltic states in your territory. All right. So the states that are closest to Russia are much more focused on defense and holding, holding their line. The states that are furthest from Russia have military capability, but it's not very deployable. It's not, they can't move a lot, right? And so you get the issue where the states have invested the most because they are, they perceive the threat, their political leaders perceive the threat as being real, have invested the most in armed forces, but they primarily focus on national defense contingencies. You have militaries who are the furthest from Russia. They talk about the threat, but the money you know, does not lie in terms of what they think their priorities are and how they spend it. And they have forces, but are often the worst position in terms of actual contribution of forces, right? Putting aside the units and brigades that are forward stationing, mm -hmm. right? Because I know somebody listening to us say, hey, what about the heavy brigade that we're building here in Lithuania? What about the other brigade that we're building here? All right, great. Let's put aside those individual brigades that, that you're willing to set up some years in the future. Um, it's still that issue of can European militaries actually get their stuff together, you know, transport it to a railhead, move it, deploy it, what can you actually move and deploy, and to what extent could you do that um, in, in on fairly short notice. And I don't, I'm not, to be clear, I'm not an expert in European defense security, so I often find myself when asked this talking somewhat past my remits, so I focus much more on adversaries and, and more, on a con more on a conversation around um, evolution, conventional warfare strategy, and what have you. But it's always interesting to come here to to forums like European Forum Albach and learn learn from European colleagues to see what conversation they're having to see uh, what what I might be missing. Excellent, Michael Kaufman. Thank you so much for your time and for your excellent analytical contribution to this transatlantic talk series. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me on.